be ready to go in five, four, three, two. Hey, Shana, thanks so much for joining us on the Destination Never Here podcast. We're really humbled and honored to be here. And uh, as we get started, I was hoping you could uh, reach out to our audience and say hello and maybe give a quick backstory about how you and I met. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here and kind of share my story, although, you know, I always humbly say I don't know how exciting of a story it is, but it's one that I am uh, proud to share. Uh, feel honored that you and I met at the National Superintendents Conference, sharing some space as we talked about school safety um, and really was impressed on the conversations that we were having, Chris, about not only my own personal journey, but um, the impact that kind of society is having on a whole with K-12 right now, um, especially going back in my time when I first started. Yeah, so the um, the conference that we met at was pretty cool. Uh, I was there with uh, Zero Now, I believe, and I gave a presentation for them and did a bunch of meet and greets. But I think some of my favorite time was hanging out with you because it was just like we've known each other forever. You're a very easy person to talk to, and I really want to say thank you for that. And, uh, you know, if anything, this podcast is made for every listener in the country, and we do get a lot um, to listen to and understand the person whom we're speaking with, right? Because nobody really wants to hear about me and I don't want to hear about me, but I want to know how, uh, how you came about to end up at that conference in the first place. So before we get all the way jumped in there to um, that meeting that we had and then how we ended up here today, where'd you grow up? I mean, do you mind answering a couple of personal questions? If you don't want to, that's fine too. Oh, no, I'm happy. I'm a, actually a proud Michigander. So born and raised in Michigan right. uh, from the Grand Rapids area. And uh, truth be told, my journey is a one of stops and starts. Um, <clears throat> I actually uh, went to college in uh, Michigan. And for the life of me, Chris, I was never going to go into education. Uh, my parents were both educators. So growing up in a teacher household, I was dead set against it. And, uh, you know, the fates have a way of bringing you to your destiny. And just like you and I meeting at that conference, uh, that's truly how I stumbled upon um, finally realizing that education was where my heart and soul uh, belonged. And uh, from there, I, I went on a lot of different um, opportunities that I truly believe shaped who I am. Um, so it depends on you how far you want me to get into that journey, but uh, it's been going strong for over 19 years since I really started diving into my own professional career and, and from there. What are the jobs that you work at and before education to quote unquote, find yourself? Cause I can tell you with me, and I mean, I think the audience knows I did everything before I was, you know, before I found the Marine Corps and the Marine Corps found me, I, you know, I was, I didn't know where I was going. Oh, well, so I will say, you know, I, I believed strongly in the uh, bartending, waitressing, serving uh, to get me through school. That was actually the, uh, kind of bar or the dead step that my parents both said, because I graduated from my undergrad um, planning to go into medicine and was just like, ooh, I just, I don't, I don't know. And uh, about eight weeks after graduating with my undergrad, my, my parents sat me down and said, well, uh, you know, bartending at TGI Fridays is probably not going to pay off those student loans. So, <laughs> uh, and then intermixed in there, uh, I did do a stint uh, doing some singing telegrams, Chris, you know, if you believe that, that was a good time. I do have a theater degree as well. Uh, but again, they were just, uh, yeah, those bartending, serving singing telegrams, community theater, it's uh, its not paying the bill, Shana. So um, I actually got talked into substitute teaching and swear that the, the pivotal moment was my first day on the job as a substitute teacher for a middle school choir class. As you can imagine, as chaotic as that would probably be, I came home and told my parents, you know what, I, I'm going to be an educator. So so that's what sparked it. Yeah. First day one, day one with a bunch of middle schoolers all day in a choir class. And getting to that point, I'm sure it wasn't just easy. It took a lot of uh, tenacity and endurance and keep coming back. But, uh, you know, part of the theme of our podcast specifically is vulnerability and authenticity, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you look at the, more, the most searched word, uh, searched word in Webster last year was authentic because mm -hmm. I think somewhere between 2018 and today, whatever it is, and a few things happened between then and now, um, people have lost track of where they are, where they came from. And I think people want to know really who they're talking to. First of all, I mean, I, I tell everybody we're not in sales, but everyone is. We sell our personality, mm -hmm. we sell ourselves, we sell 
uh, what we want to have for dinner, you know, or we buy what the other person's selling us where we're going to eat dinner, et cetera. So people buy from who they like and who they trust. And, you know, it's very transactional. So we try to get into the personal side, not, not so much emotional side, but the personal side of there's always a human behind the shield of trying to put together better solutions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you hear that you, you come from, uh, you know, the same background my daughter did when she graduated college. Uh, she was a server, she was a bartender, and then found her passion with what she wanted to do. But th was teaching your passion right out of the gate, or did you find that it took a little bit of uh, humility here and there to say, I I'm going to stick with this? Uh, I would say teaching, yes, right out the gate. Uh, I really enjoyed it. What was harder was the decisions and the sacrifices you have to make as you look to potentially progress through your career. Um, and so that was one as I moved in, you know, just my short snippet of a, a background, Chris, is um, after I started my first year teaching um, in an urban school district, um, you know, layoffs happened. And so when you talk about humility, you have a passion and you're suddenly without a job. Uh, and, and you're left to question, well, what now? Do I have to pivot careers? Do I need to give up on that dream? Um, or do I need to think outside the box? And having that ability to wrestle with and embrace that loss um, and then also pick yourself up by the bootstraps um, is actually what led me to the next phase of my career, which was I got a job in England and I taught in England for a year. Um, and again, those hardships, as much as I wanted that to work, um, just our exchange rates and the financial situations is once again, where I found myself falling quickly and needing to make that really difficult decision of what do I do now? Again, do I abandon what I know I love? Um, do I again, pick myself up and see what doors can open? And I ended up thankfully in Massachusetts for nine and a half years, um, but along that way, and that's where I started my career in administration, um, there are a lot of pitfalls. And to be honest, and I'll bring in kind of the woman thing, it's also really hard to be a leader as a woman um, in, in our society still today. So there were definitely some times of coming home and crying and ask if I was strong enough to keep going, um, but I'm glad I did. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not easy for sure by any means. So you just opened up. I have a list of questions that I think I'm just going <laughs> to take them because I, they don't mean anything. You just open up a whole, a whole box of uh, better questions to ask because the, you know, the Amazon nexus, the, the solution act, mm -hmm. I mean, that's why we're here. Yeah. But you just, you took my brain in a whole new direction, uh, which is not that hard to do. Apparently um, everybody seems to be able to do that, but um, it, it, in a good way, you know, I'm really interested to hear more about the uh, gender inequality, if you will, because I do know it exists. I mean, as in the Marine Corps, and think about this, the 90s, right? I'm over 50. Yeah. And um, that transition really changed. And then being a girl dad with my daughter just under 30, um, I, I do see that even today. It's just difficult mm -hmm. to wrap your me, for me to wrap my head around it to understand how that happens. And I think I raised a strong leader and she has some of the same challenges. And this isn't really about her or you or everybody. But I think, you know, I've, I've found that when one person has a unique problem it turns out it's not so unique the mm -hmm. nine out of ten people have it so what could you share with us like one of the most challenging aspects of being a woman in an administrative role trying to either promote or lead yeah i think first and foremost is perception and you know i've done a lot chris to try to dive into why why is there always a perception and um even even now, I mean, my husband is a school administrator. Uh, he's actually a superintendent. Um, but I would compare, and there were times I would come home just really defeated and say, you know, this is what I said. You know, this is this is the conversation we had either in a meeting or when we're talking in front of other leadership. And the feedback was that I came across as being um, too strong or, you know, leaning towards that B word. Um, but I know if you had said the exact same thing in the exact same tone, you would have been strong and you would have been take charge. Um, and to be honest, Chris, it, it's so defeating when you get that, that response, um, even from women, right? And so you feel like you hope sometimes, and, and I'm sure your daughter or any other woman in leadership or considering leadership, 
it is a very still solitary um, experience. There are not a lot, and I know there's a lot of organizations that are working towards continuing to have women advocacy. Um, but sometimes when you look around the table and, and no, no disrespect, but you see a bunch of men and you're of one or two females at the table, you do feel that lone um, defeatist, you know, I have to put my armor on, right? Sure. And then how is that armor going to be taken? So, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, I wish I could say we could get to the heart of it, but I think perception overall, and until we can start to truly shift the perception of how I say something um, should be taken the same way as if a male counterpart said it, I, you know, it's going to be an uphill battle. That's really well said, honestly. I mean, I, I, cause I'm, I'm there with you in the fight and the, you know, I think the listeners will be too, because you're not saying woe is me because it's something Shannon did. It's like, it's because it's the whole gamut of it's the mm -hmm. industry. And I, you know, you like it. Everybody has a personal story where they can liken this too, but, um, starting off as a police officer when I first started you know you're the rookie and here I came from the Marine Corps very senior leadership position promoting well through the ranks and I started at zero again I knew I was at zero but being you know I, I call it the humility pill where you have to just take it every now and again and say okay I'm going to deal with this but then it becomes irrationally stupid mm -hmm. and you know <laughs> I, I, my, cl my clinical psychology degree would tell you um, I call it SOS, right? Stuck on stupid. And, you know, obviously not, but um, <laughs> people, you know, people just have that perception of, I believe I'm doing something right because they don't want to hear what you have to say. They want to tell you what they want to, what they want you mm -hmm. to hear. Mm -hmm. And I believe that some of those things transcend all boundaries, whether it's uh, gender, sex, leadership, w whatever race, uh, religion, uh, even um, aptitudes right where people they, they they demand that you know what their problem is so you liken it back to when we're children we have no problems we have no we haven't learned that inhibition issue we haven't learned how not to be silent and now we think oh well, if i say this then what i think that's what's you really transparent that comes across in this and uh, i really appreciate it because that is vulnerable and that literally is we had the <laughs> you know for the listeners, Ruben is on the background of this. He's the executive producer. And we had somebody on here from the FBI, the chief of the behavioral science unit a month and a half ago. And I forgot I was interviewing him. I became a fan. I just wanted to hear more <laughs> of what he was saying. And similar to what is happening right now, and um, but in this sector. And uh, he's telling me these stories. And he himself went right into the you know vulnerability stage. It was a great interview. And, uh, you know, this is going to be a great interview. So I, I'm really grateful for you. Thank you. Because yeah. I was about to ask a silly question. Like, tell me the most embarrassing thing happened <laughs> when you were doing a singing telegram. Like, did you forget <laughs> the words to a song? Did you not like a, a costume you had to wear? Like, I can't figure out how that works. And I'm not asking that because of uh, anything other than you graduated college or, you know, you're working as a, a wait staff and bartender. And I can't even tell you what I did. I don't even remember. I, I think I stacked tires for a year, but um, you know, the most degrading thing possible. But I remember some funny stories too that came from mm -hmm. that and it made me who I am today. Do you liken any of that back to that type of experience with a degree in theater? Um, so I, I, I do. Um, it's interesting. There's multiple pieces of my personality that I think have come through and I've gotten feedback from other people. One is that authenticity. I, um, uh, and I think that goes back to kind of how I've had to, I hate to use the word, Chris, but scrape and crawl and climb, you know? Oh, sure. And mm -hmm. I did it really, and to be honest, I did it really fast for most. I mean, um, when I left education as an associate superintendent, I was 42 years old. So I went from a teacher starting at 25 to an associate superintendent at 42, but it was out it wasn't without some blood, sweat, and tears and scrapes along the way, but what it did teach me is to always be an authentic first and foremost. Um, you know, you likened it to everyone's, everyone's got a sales and everyone's got a pitch that they're trying to get from you. And when you can come to the table of, I truly am interested first and foremost to listen to what's going on, um, to be a solution seeker. Um, to empathize with your situation, even though I might not know it exactly. Um, 
is part of that authenticity because then I can then advocate for the right answer. And you might not like that right answer, um, but at least I know that I'm coming from a place of advocating for the right answer because of everything I learned first before trying to talk you into it. And so theater helped with that in terms of, you know, one thing you get on the stage is you have to be in the moment. I, I used to direct um, theater and actually I, I've done a couple of community directing in, in things and I always would teach my actors be in the moment, be in the moment. Don't think ahead. Don't think to the line that you memorized four pages down or even the line that's two pages down, because if you're not in the moment, you can't authentically react to those that you are engaging with in real time. So that training um, has really taught me even in real life. Don't think ahead. I mean, a lot of times, even as you ripped it up, we come with a preloaded script. Um, and that preloaded script can sometimes do more harm than it is good, um, especially when we go back to trying to impact people's lives or be a leader um, or, you know, create change management. Um, so. Yeah, we can't get to the real you with my pre-written questions, even though they were a mere <laughs> guide, but then, you know, you have that instant, uh, you know, I found that authenticity and we'll get move past this quickly, but um, passion, authenticity, even some vulnerability, vulnerability is easy because you can fall into that just by being happy or sad, but the, those other two authentic and passion driven, you can't hide it, fake it or make it. You have to, it either comes out or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And you know that when you go somewhere, you just don't want to go and you meet somebody you're like mm, they're telling you all their stories over and over and over and over again. And if you listen long enough, they'll tell you again. But you're trying to say there you want to move past that or you want to help them. And some people just can't help themselves. And then you walk into the room and you walk into a conference and Chris meets you. And it's like, <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh, you know, it, and it's right. And it's not like, um, you know, male, female, it doesn't matter. It's not a. It's not a um, transactional thing. It's a human connection. Mm -hmm. And that energy, you can't hide it. And once you have it, um, you want to give it to some people and you don't others. I mean, I mm. I have a hundred bums on this podcast, which have been great, but not so great. And I have a hundred hits that are great, not great, but that's the vulnerable part. You just got to keep going. And I think that's what's going to take us down the next uh, path. I asked you really all those questions to get to this point right here. You know, the Active Shooter Prevention Project this isn't a commercial for that. I, but what it is, is we are in the business of the human model, not a business model. We run a human model. And it's because we have everybody. I'm talking about from a kindergartner, pre-kindergartner to their teacher, into government agencies, Department of Defense. Everybody's bought into the model that we have for the most part. There's a lot of naysayers, but that's business, right? So you mm -hmm. have to you have to address those silly things. But we're coming at this from both sides. And I want to, I've talked to parents, chief of behavioral science unit, director of the AT, assistant deputy director of the ATF, um, little old me running these interviews. Direct, you know, we have a national nuclear security director coming on here pretty quick. And now, you know, we have somebody representing Amazon. I, I, I'm, I'm going to tap that down so it's not just about, oh, look, you know, Amazon's joined the show. Instead, I want it to be you join the show, right? that mm -hmm. um, you have some solutions and some ideas. And I'd like to interview you, if you will, um, about active shooters. But first, I'm going to just let you open up and tell us what is the Amazon K-12 solution? And then go back just a little bit and tell me, how did you get to Amazon? Like, yeah. that, that's a that's a great, not because I can't believe you did it, but I'm very proud to know you. I mean, that's what, it, after speaking to you privately, uh, you know, offset, yeah. I, I really want to share that with the audience. Yeah, so before we go into how I ended up here, um, in speaking more against that passion, um, the K-12 EDU, and, and I will say Amazon is, has an education as a whole solution now that is e actually touching higher ed. Um, it's touching our charter and private preschools, but truly the Amazon for Education is trying to look at the needs of educators um, all the way down to the student all the way back up to the administrator, recognize that now more than ever, time is of an essence, right? And so we need our educators to be able to um, put their time back where it belongs, which is in the classroom to our students and all that other stuff, um, all the way down to, and I know we'll talk a little bit about the um, active shooter kits that we, uh, I say, unfortunately, um, are, are being able to put together for school districts. Um, helping those get to where they need to be so that they are prepared 
for the unfortunate without having to spend time trying to figure out how to be prepared for the unfortunate. And I, I use active shooter kits as an example, Chris, but you know, those solutions are going all the way down to helping um, teachers get what they need in their classrooms, helping your janitors get what they need for their, um, to clean your school buildings, your maintenance, your food service in a way that everyone knows the Amazon shopping experience, right? I, I use it way too much as my husband will complain. Toxic, <laughs> toxic relationship with Amazon Prime. Toxic That's relationship with, you know, no, it's a great relationship. Um, so everybody knows that shopping experience. And so Amazon Business for Education is saying, let's take that personal experience, but customize it for how educational professionals need to purchase and get what they need quickly, uh, efficiently. And again, put time back to where they really need to put their energy, which is to kids. Is that every sector? So we can go through, uh, you know, this will probably be like a chopped up into a couple blocks. The yeah. interview will be straight there, but we'll use some uh, channel blocks. So if that's true, which I know it is, can you discuss, does it go elementary, middle, high school, and then educate, you know, um, a continuing education, adult education, postgraduate, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. And, and I would say one thing that I have appreciated about Amazon once we get to how I got here is they have been very receptive um, to the feedback I'm giving to that insight of how are educators viewing things? What do we need to see? How do we shop? Um, and, you know, anyone that looked back at Amazon business when it started in 2015 to even what we're about to roll out for, you know, this back to school season coming up already um, is that reflective feedback and that response to feedback of, you know, you can go on Amazon for education's website. If you're a customer, um, you know, Amazon Business for Education isn't accessible to the general public. You have to be a school district or a higher ed institution. Um, but they they can quickly see there's an early elementary, early childhood section now. There's an a kind, uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, and then post-secondary. So all of those things are really, again, with the ultimate goal of how can we make your purchasing easier, not harder, um, so that you can get back to what you need to do for the daily. And what are some of the, um, let's say, let's put it into Prime. And I was joking where I am in a toxic relationship with Amazon Prime. And the doorbell <laughs> rings four times a day and it's my mm -hmm. new Amazon order. It, it, heck, even when I'm on the road traveling, I have to call my neighbor. Hey, can you grab my package or whatever? You know, there's rolls of toilet paper or paper towels down the street. You know, just funny. I have but, my ring um, camera where now I can see when they've been dropped off. Although it's also uh, bad when your dogs actually just know the sound of the <laughs> delivery truck. They don't have to wait for the doorbell. They know the sound the truck makes. <laughs> like, okay, oh. Or, or your, your dog is like, I'm not barking anymore. It's just the Amazon person. <laughs> and I wish they would get to that point. <laughs> soon uh so what type of solutions are we putting together so how how does that work for you are um let's let's go backward just for a moment you are an, uh, in administration right mm -hmm. what was the highest position you were you held there so I, I i just want to talk off the cuff associate superintendent so you're associate superintendent um and you are obviously in the administrative track uh, outside of the teaching track and you're making decisions. How did you get from the one place to where you are now? No gory details, of course, but just how was that transition made and then how do you feel it's going for you personally? Yeah, so going back to that vulnerability, right? Um, COVID, as we know, did a number on a lot of us in education. And I give huge kudos to those that have stuck it out and are still fighting the fight and maintaining the course. Mine happened to be a combination of um, some COVID burnout as a high level administrator, and then just some personal family issues where um, I needed to really reevaluate um, my home life balance, homework life balance. And um, staying as a top level administrator was detrimental. So um, I kind of put the feelers out and knew that I could not step away 100% Chris from education. Like I said, once once I from that day one back at that middle school choir class, um, I can't ever step away from education, which is why you'll always hear me say we um, I, as an educator, I'm an educator, we in schools. Um, and I actually had no idea that Amazon Business for Education existed as an associate superintendent or even a high school principal. 
And I, I actually use that in my talk track as I'm connecting with other school districts now of, if only I had known Animas on Business for Education existed, I would have gone back in time because I could have saved my secretaries, um, my building principals, my directors so much unnecessarily used time, energy, and frustration. So um, made the leap, came over to Amazon Business for Education because I believed in what they were trying to do. Uh, I was actually the first um, K-12 public administrator that the organization has ever hired. So I, I'm wow. proud of that. <laughs> get, you a, get you a plaque. I know. I, I do have a few. Not for that. But um, I, I am the very first. You know, they've hired some teachers and educators, but I was the first at my level experience to come into the organization. And the thing I loved most is that from day one, I was able to say, listen, this is not how you talk education, right? <laughs> You're talking like a business. We have to empathize. These people are day in and day out with the most human capital or um, centric um, profession you can think about. And also the most um, heavily observed, um, heavily critiqued organize, you know, uh, organization or career pathway. And that's where I said, if you even look, um, I, I'm so proud of the shifts that Amazon continues to make under my recommendation. Not to say I'm like perfect. Um, no, no. Just looking for other ways of better connecting to school districts. And out of that has really come, you know, our solution sets are twofold. We really focus on how can we help administrators, but then how can we help what we call the end user, right? Your teachers and your secretaries that are needing to place those purchases day in and day out. Um, so those are the kind of the two buckets of our solution sets is making um, life more compliant, making those, um, you know, getting what you need and those audits that all happen up at the top level, while making the ability for a teacher to get what she needs or he needs in their classroom as quickly and cost effectively as possible. So the people that are listening to this are probably like me. And I mean, I'm in the business of active shooter prevention, right? How long <laughs> have you guys... Um... How, how long has Amazon really been chasing this? I mean, I think it's a pretty new market, but it's been around for a while. It's actually relatively new, I would say, within the last six to eight months of really recognizing oh, wow. the need. And again, that came from actually voice of the superintendents and voices of um, those that were, I remember the very first one I heard was a purchasing secretary reached out and said, my superintendent just charged me with ordering 584 active shooter backpacks. And I've been pulling my hair out trying to source this and that. And yes, we have this whole list that was recommended recommended to us by our emergency response manager. Um, but I'm having um, a, a heck of a time trying to find a tourniquet, uh, Israeli bandages, you know, stop the bleed. And and I said, well, you know what? That you're not the first. And so going to leadership and saying this is a need. And that's the other thing that I just really admire about Amazon is. They're really listening to what do you need and how we can make it easier. It's not that they're trying to, because I, this is a, another seller or vendor that's going to put this solution on the market. It's Amazon and being able to take their resources to say, let's pull together a solution. So those secretaries, you know, that just heard from their superintendent aren't having to visit 8 million different websites to try to find all these pieces, trying to find a warehouse now to get, you know, students or staff to assemble these, then push them out. Um, so we're, we're about, we're still new in it, um, but I believe strongly in the commitment and the recognition that, and I will always use this word, unfortunately, um, we're working to try to bet, find a better, easier solution for those that need it. Well, let me tell you how happy I am to work with, um, different teachers and subsets and administrations and, and especially you here. I mean, really honored to have you here today. I can't say that enough, uh, not just because I'm silly. We, I, I, there's so many ideas to reach out to schools and, you know, we're going to reduce this to the Chris factor. I call it the good idea fairy, right? Mm -hmm. They land all day long with good ideas, what they want. You know, we teachers, you want to be safe from active shooters Buy this new lock and it's available on whatever, right? It goes in the bottom of the door and you're going to stop all these things. But you look at what happened in uh, many of the shootings. Yep. And unfortunately that's my job, right? Um, that lock not only didn't work, but it wouldn't work and it wouldn't have done anything. Mm -hmm. And some, some of the conversations I have back and forth, I have an exceptionally large following on LinkedIn. Um, I, people try to bait me in with these conversations. You're just you, this, you know, you're in business. 
and they don't, they have no idea, right? I was an inactive shooter in 2010, wrote a postgraduate degree on it in 2012, one of the four people in the country with both of those two things, and there's a fifth now coming. Shout out to Michael Howell. Keep going, buddy. Your PhD is almost done. I do not have a PhD, <laughs> so I, hopefully he'll take my job. I'm tired of reading about these. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, the reason, yeah, the reason I wanted to shout that out, though, it's been 69 years. I'm not even sure you know this, but it's been 69 years since we've killed a child in a school fire, right? It, the, the metric is different. It's, sometimes it says zero, sometimes it says 10. We're just going to say a child because, you know, it, that's the most grotesque thing you can think of. Mm -hmm. But you, do you want to know why we did that? Why we've stopped killing children in school fires? Because we got tired of it. One day we woke up and said, this is enough. So every time, and this is some, you know, like big brother Chris advice, but because I have to talk myself into it every day. But um, every time you feel like, ah, oh, what well, unfortunately we need, and, and you're right, it is unfortunate, but just like smoke detectors and smoke yep. alarms and fire detectors and sprinkler systems and pull down handles, big red trucks, the firefighters, fort, you know, we're glad we have them. So we, yeah. you know, we need, we need to be glad that we can get these things. It's just tragic that we even need them in the first place. And uh, you, you're doing the right thing. Just keep, and I can tell you, pedal down, you know, every time you feel a little bit uh, strange about it, like happy, but can't believe it, know mm -hmm. that you're making a difference for tomorrow. And, and I think, Chris, that goes back to my experience, right? Uh, you know, in my various administrative roles, um, and even now, because I do consult uh, with, with school districts is uh, on the side, um, we have to face the reality. And, you know, I, I use the example, and this came from my own, you know, training back in the day, but there's a reason every time you're on an airplane, they keep doing the same message, right? Because if you actually keep hearing it and you keep looking for your exits, you're more likely to survive a plane crash. Heaven forbid a plane crash ever happens. And so we need to get in that same rhythm when it comes to active shooters. Um, and and I, am, I make the cry far and loud. Um, like I said, my husband is still in administration. He's a superintendent and he is taking up that call as well as this isn't just something to have on the books. It's not a book to keep in a crate. It's to be practiced as often as um, your tornado drills. Sorry, I'm from Michigan. We do have those. Sure. Of course. <laughs> and those are Midwest, but your tornado drills, you know, your, your fire drills, um, all of those are common practice where we don't even blink at, right? Um, we talk back to the older generation when they had bomb drills, right? Well, that was their reality. And this is unfortunately our reality. And part of that needs to include that response, uh, you know, and that's where, you know, looking more at like that active shooter response backpack, because I've heard firsthand, and I would say the same, I don't mean my teachers, if there's an emergency, trying to find that big go bucket or trying to, you know, this is just my personal opinion. I need them to be able to swing a backpack on their back, grab some kids by the hands and run and then be able to triage yeah. wherever they are. Um, and so, you know, it needs to be second place. I know even back in my day, we had flip charts, which I still think is kind of silly, but we had flip charts of, you know, if this, if this happens, then do this. Well, you know, having an active shooter backpack in every classroom, um, in every space, I think is an important uh, piece of our normalcy that we need to build in. If you look at those flip charts, you might see my name at the bottom of a few. Of them. I wrote some of those, you know, back in the early days. This is going to be, uh, this will be like almost a commercial for you because this isn't about the Chris show, right? This is going to be about the you show mm -hmm. and, um, and you can use this, but people don't realize that the businesses, you know, the business of active shooter prevention and response has turned into a $5.5 billion industry before you realize cleanup. And, you know, I, I really hate to be as drastic as that, but that's really mm -hmm. what we're talking about. And we're talking mm -hmm. about from the moment this happens, when you grab a backpack, you're cleaning up a bad situation, right? Where you're surviving, you're doing everything you can. Did you know that schools have 22 different variations of what to do during an active shooter? There's a story on the books about a school where a child pulled the fire alarm, but the protocol in the school was not to pull the fire alarm. And it just created a new level of chaos. So we won't discuss which one or where or how long ago. But it's it's relative enough that we need to discuss that. And there's a company, um, and it's not a shout out to them, but I am going to give them a plug. Um, Blaze Defense out of Birmingham, Alabama. They've been building these active shooter kits, some similar for years. But I don't think it's the it, it their boutique. They they make it for the for the company, and we can't reach every school across the country with boutique. But unfortunately, and th the reason I like him is his. 
they are integrity personified. Like everything that goes in there, they back. The difference is they pack it for the community. Oh, you need the most common injuries, band-aids, back team, whatever you want to call it. Now that's how old I am. That's uh, all spray, I, I know exactly yeah, what you're spray, talking about. Yeah, spray clean, whatever. And then you add one from the left, right? Now you need some other mosquito bite all the way to the right, a tourniquet. And you know, when you start talking about a tourniquet, okay, well, wh where's the training for that? And right. you have stop the stop the bleed training. Well, now you have stop the bleed training and post bleed, pre bleed, uh, advanced life saving, beginner life saving, and it becomes into that good idea fairy where everybody's again, especially as a school administrator. Okay, what do I do? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna just I'm here to tell you we do have a national standard. I know you know that it's you know the pro model. It's about prevention, response, and options, and it's just looking at each facet. And saying this is what you do for prevention, this is what you do for response, and these are the options you can use. So obviously you would fall under that option side, but you would also fall under the other two as well. It's a continuum; it just doesn't stop. And you can go backwards, forward, sideways. You can always end up where you need to be without fear. And the number one thing we want to do is be not fearful. So imagine a smoke detector in a school 70 years ago, mm -hmm. saving lives, right? But it took 69 years. Mm -hmm. So we look at this and say, okay, we have gun detection. That's kind of like smoke. Hey, where there's smoke, there's fire. Well, where there's gun, there might be intent. So we have detection. Well, then you have gunshot detection. It's too late. The guns are shooting, but we also have fire um, detection. And it's too late. The building's on fire. There's a way to smart evacuate, right? But one of 22 things are what school districts are doing. Run, hide, fight, react, escape, survive, shelter in place, activate active shooter protocols, um, I avoid, deny, defend. I, you can just go on. And they're great things. But as you transcend each level of elementary, middle school, high school, what works best? Well, it evolves. And we don't have an evolution chart yet. That's why we are so happy to have you today. Because it's, it's my belief when you put all these things together in one and you offer the solutions and we have something called the wheel, we, you know, we, we're offering, we want to make you part of that one way or the other. And, um, you know, I, I don't even know what that looks like. That's just off the top of my head, but, um, because it really is solution focused and we really are trying to retire this and we really are trying to just do podcasts and getting the message out exactly what you said. When you're on an airplane, you hear the same message. We can tell the same message to our kids because I'm over, I told you I'm over 50. We had duck and cover. It's because yeah. the right, the Russians were sending missiles, ceiling tiles are going to hit us in the head get under our desk. Well, that's not the best place to be anymore. So uh, for the current modern day threats and what you're doing is brilliant. So how, how can we help? What, if you had a, a magic wand, what, what would we be able to do from destination ever here, whether it's the podcast or the pro model or the active shooter prevention project. And we talk to congressmen and senators all the time, literally, what, what would be a magic wand thing that we could do to help you anything? I think the big thing is going back to what you said, you know, now everyone knows what to do when that fire alarm goes off, right? It, and how to get out of that building and how to get out of that building is standardized by the building, right? That's why you practice and practice and practice. But the response is still the same, no matter if you're a preschooler, a high school or a college student. We need to do better at standardizing, right? We need to do better. Like you said, duck and cover was a, a phrase that was used all the time. Um, I can say, speaking from just the two districts where I was a high-level administrator, we couldn't even agree upon what was the difference between secure mode, lockdown, was it soft mode? When that happens, you raise the anxiety and the confusion for not only the staff responding, but the students responding. And then forget about, I mean, just add in your, your response teams, right? So your emergency response teams. The more we can standardize and help administration across the country, no matter if you're the smallest of the small or the biggest of the big school districts, having that response at least be known where if you hear this, this is what it means. This is what you need to do. Look for that red backpack. Maybe you saw that red backpack when you were a first grader and you were taught through those drills and you were great. And then in ninth grade, an active shooting happened. But you know what? You knew as a student, Maybe your teacher unfortunately got shot. You knew as a student that what that red backpack meant, right? Um, and, and I think that's where advocating that we make this more of a normal preparedness conversation. 
right? And we can do a lot, and, and I don't think anyone has the magic wand of how to prevent these. You know, I think that's where all the politics get in, get in the way, um, and I'm not going to go that, but at least if we can standardize our response to be consistent, the more we're going to be back on the track of airplanes where it's a very standard, I don't care what airline you fly, you hear the same message. Uh, right. And I can fly any airline and I'm still going to be told where my exits are and I'm going to still be told that my air mask is going to drop down. And we don't do that yet today. And I think that's where, my, from my personal experience, both from being an educator to working for Amazon, is where I want to say we have to make everyone aware so that even if, let's say, you change school districts or go to a different state, you still know what's being said, you still know what to look for. That's... <laughs> You just summed up the whole thing in, in one sentence, and, and you're right. That's 100% accurate. And we have parents and teachers. The parents want where we – so we'll go into a school district sometimes. And I don't do uh, training anymore. I just do public speaking. But we have a, a lot of trainers within our you know organization. And they'll go into school districts, and they'll come back and say, well, the teachers want one thing, administration wants another, and then the parents are outside. And we have three different competing interests all of them with a common nexus of the child, but none of them are on the same page. And it, what you said, we have to be able to get over politics. We have to be able to speak beyond. I, you know, I've, I've been on every television show talking about these things and from documentaries on Nat Geo and Discovery to the, you know, nightly news breaking on every news network. And I, oh, I, I, I don't watch myself on television. I've never even seen myself on this thing. But um, I'll tell you, I'm not brave enough. My daughter gives me plenty of feedback. But uh, <laughs> at, at the end of every one of those interviews, I say, we're only going to be back here again if we don't break out of this conversation loop. Because the loop is what the, the interest of that human being is instead of the interest of really solving the problem. And then you have a whole bunch of people in this $5.5 billion industry showing up with their new good idea. And mm -hmm. you don't understand, my training program is better than your training program. And if we just look at the top, you know, this is sad, 25 active shooters. You know, this year, I think we're on pace for 70 plus. Last year, it was 50. The year before that, it was 61. But as they dropped, they got more lethal. So it's not fair to say we're doing better. Mm -hmm. And our response times are slowing down. So we really are in all about prevention. What does that look like? And what tools can we give you to help actually prevent them to start? And, and there are plenty out there. It's a matter of which one works for you, though, and finding that that where you can thread the needle. It's not boutique; it's for everybody. Mm -hmm. And there isn't there isn't exactly everybody, but people also believe that about fire. So here we are. We have a long way to go, and uh, pretty excited to get there because you know that's why we that's why I named this whole de this podcast "Destination Never Here." We never, you know, everybody says hashtag strong. Well, do you want to be strong, or do you right. want to? end this right like never here we we can do this and um there's one thing i want to circle back to um what type of pushback are you getting so we get we don't want our school to look like a fortress and i tell everybody it won't we implement these things and we're active shooter resilient and proof as much as we are fire resilient fireproof and it's not a prison it's like the most open and transparent place there is and i say well how what about I don't know, teaching my child about stop the bleed. Well, they've learned some of that in school as it is now. Do, have you had any of that pushback yet, or are they pretty much open? I think right now pretty much open. I think the solution that we're trying to put together with like this backpack option is it's just that it's a backpack. Um, you know, it, it's no different than, again, let's use that fire example. Everyone's used to seeing a fire alarm in the hallways. Now they may look a little bit different, but for the most part, it's red, it's got a flashing light, it's got a siren, right? They're not blinking twice at that. So looking at a solution that is not only mobile, but is a backpack, something we're used to seeing in a school setting, um, I think helps with that so that it's not, you know, and, and I do know this and, and I did for my former days. And, and again, I'm not going against the go buckets because that was where we were in that day. Right. No, no. Yeah. But there was changed. definitely, so. there was definitely a stigma around that too, of kids wanting to know, and, you know, you had to go through and then there was the privacy curtain to pull out. And then there was the, that it did stick out as something not normal. Whereas again, you can go in most classrooms and they probably do have a first aid kit 
you know, or we talk about AEDs. Every school now has AEDs strategically placed across their, their school. Um, so we need to get to that point where it's commonplace. I'm not weirded out by seeing the red backpack that's strategically hung in the corner for easy grab, right? Um, so, so not yet. I'm sure it's coming, Chris. You know, not one. There's always going to be somebody. But I go back to normalizing, standardizing a response. So, no matter what school you're at, no matter what state you're at, um, you can count on that piece of safety in the case of emergency. Uh, wild question: Do you have a backpack with you? Not, not, don't get it. I don't. Don't. Sorry, okay, I don't. Sorry, I don't. I actually. No, 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 that's okay. I had I had an example of one at um, the superintendent conference, but I did not bring mm -hmm. it back. Uh, we ended up donating it. So that's uh, awesome. But it will be coming out. We we are going to start um, as we have continued to build this option. Um, we're formalizing some of our um, advertising marketing, so superintendent school districts can be on the lookout. We'll be uh, pushing that out in a more formalized manner in the next couple of weeks. All right. I think what we're gonna do right now is take a quick one minute break and then come back and, and wrap up or two minutes, whatever you'd okay. like. Um, Ruben, are you good to take us in the outro here or add the break or where? Uh, all I really wanna do is make sure, have I not asked you something that you want me to ask you? Do you have mm -hmm. a, the, now might be a good place where you say, I just, you know, Ruben can put this on the website uh, or on the podcast and it'd be a picture of the backpack or how to order Perfect. it. Yeah. So I am securing that photo. Um, we asked the vendor that is putting this together specifically um, to get us a nice stock photo so that we can have it. Um, so as soon as I get that, I'll make sure that you guys have that. And then um, also I can probably provide a way of uh, contacting their Amazon representative. Cool. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. We can throw that up there. It'll take probably three weeks to get this out anyways. Maybe. That'll be perfect. That's actually perfect timing because what we're trying to, in terms of timing wise of really pushing this out as a formal solution now, you know, I previewed it at the superintendent's conference um, and then we're really looking to roll it out in like the May, June, when we know people will be looking to use up their emergency funds before the fiscal year ends to be ready for the school year. So that'll probably be a nice, perfect Time. All right. So let's, uh, we'll talk when we come back on live, we'll talk about, um, or recorded live. We'll talk about, uh, using some of those funds. If you, do you know enough to, and not that you don't know enough, but do you know en enough to where you could convince me why ESA funds are real or not real or what they're for or not for? I mean, I, I know too much about them, unfortunately. But I there's do. There's so many people that, okay, good. Do you mind? Oh, there's so many that don't. And it's actually crazy that there's still so much unspent. It drives me crazy, but okay. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think that'd be good. And then um, if you just give yourself a good one minute plug for Amazon and your position, because we're going to break this up into an AI thing that um, it goes in, it chops these videos into 30 and one minute, 30 seconds, one minute, and we'll, you can make yourself some free commercials. So it'd be awesome. awesome. Great. You, yep. good, you good with that, Ruben? I am perfectly fine with that. Let's talk about Midpoint Technology Group. Maintaining safety and security is crucial for the success of any business. Property owners and managers often hire on-site security guards to be physically present during non-business hours, particularly overnight. However, employing security guards can be expensive, requiring ongoing training and supervision. Despite these efforts, guards cannot monitor every part of a property at all times. Midpoint Technology Group offers a smarter solution with remote video surveillance, providing real-time security camera monitoring to detect and respond to any suspicious activity quickly. This service not only helps to deter crime, but also supports investigations of any incidents that may occur on the property. Midpoint provides a cost-effective and efficient alternative to traditional on-site security guards, offering better coverage and reducing security incidents. To learn more about their range of customized services, visit them online at midpointtechnologygroup.com. And let's talk about Clear Armor. They're dedicated to enhancing the safety and well-being of communities by creating secure environments with high-performance security glass laminates. Clear Armor can transform ordinary glass on buildings into one-way armor that withstands multiple threat levels. Their products serve a wide range 
of industries, from education to government, and banking to corporations and other facilities where active threats make security laminates essential. For more information on how Clear Armor can protect your environment, visit them online at clear-armor.com. And now, let's return back to the show. All right, everybody, welcome back. Thanks for taking that five minute break with us. Um, I want to take a minute and introduce the backpack that um, Shane is really advertising, if you will, through Amazon and one of the solutions that is for active shooters in schools. So the floor is yours. Thanks. So again, going back, Chris, to what we were talking about, um, we want a, a solution that fits in the normal setting for students and teachers. And so leaning on a red backpack, again, trying to normalize, standardize what to look for. So at its premise, it's a simple red backpack, no different than your school backpack, but this one would be placed in a main or an area that would be easy for teachers, students to grab in a case of emergency. From there, we have worked with some of our top emergency management um, experts onto what to have in it. So um, having the basics of uh, tourniquets, uh, some Israeli bandages and other such resources, and then some basic um, first aid uh, solutions as well. Uh, and then also the opportunity to include things like glucose packs um, for our students uh, in, in the very real emergency of, you know, our diabetics if they would need that. So again, just trying to have everything in one spot. So reducing the amount of think, um, as I'm sure you or folks have been trained, um, when we come down to an emergency, we want to be able to grab and do. And so putting it all in one place to grab, that's our solution. Um, and we can have these on bulk order. They can be shipped directly to the school district and then sourced to each classroom as needed. Can you just tell us about funding really quick? There's a lot of misconceptions out there about ESA funds and funds that people have and don't have. What's been your experience just in, the, in a minute or so? Yeah, so most places uh, you will have two options. Um, we have federal ESSER funds that are about to run out in September 2024. Uh, and so I know school districts, ESSER really can be used for um, safety and security. Obviously, it, the first was for PPI and learning loss, but a, a portion of those ESSER funds can be utilized for safety secure measures, such as um, these emergency backpacks. Uh, there will also be state and federal uh, homeland security grants, either through your state police departments or through the federal homeland security that um, are up for grabs, or many of you might even still have um, that need to be used. So really advocating that now is the time, as hopefully people have heard on your podcast with us today, um, now is the time to just embrace uh, this solution um, as one piece of your pro model um, to make sure that your staff and students are equipped in the case of an emergency. So use up those funds. Don't be afraid to use those ESSER funds for this particular purchase as well. And uh, do you have a name for the backpack yet? Uh, we, it's interesting. We're working to really make it standardized. Uh, mm -hmm. We're looking at school emergency response backpack. Like it, like it a lot. Well, Shane, I can't tell you how grateful we are for having you today, uh, especially to your uh, bosses and everyone up the chain. A very big shout out to Amazon for the gracious time they lent you to us. And thank you. Uh, I think the audience has learned a lot and heard a lot. And I just want everybody to remember it's okay to be normal. Like every day, we got to get back to normal together. Civility yep. exists. Got to remember how to do it. These conversations, one a day, will you know get us there. And I try to remember everybody smiles. So thank you so much for sharing your time with me at the conference. Thank you for sharing your time with me today. I know our executive producer, Ruben, thanks you. I need to give a quick shout out to Clear Armor, our sponsor for today's show. Dave Trudeau over there in um, Chicago, Illinois you know, doing the work of everybody else, making these little uh, panels and inserts for ballistic material. Um, some are, you know, some are needed and some maybe not so much, but what Clear Armor does is exceptional. N nobody like them to be part of our community of experts. So we're honored to have you and thank you again. Have a good day. Thanks.